just go into a class and sit down and learn whatever. To me, it was more like, hey, I'm, I'm learning something that is going to affect my whole family, you know? Either you have child or not, married, single, at some point it will affect your family because that's what it is, you know? It's a tool that it will help you. That's really all I would tell them. It's, it's just to help you to better understand who we are and, and, and where we are headed and how to engage. Uh, spiritually speaking, through the Bible, the things like like engage are are, are, are to, to to equip um, the body, to equip the church. But we only come together as as Graceway, you know, once or maybe twice a week, you know. And so the rest of the week, you know, the church is wherever you are, you know. And so and so just understanding that, understanding that um, that I can I can be the church wherever I'm at. You know whatever, and, and, and that that it should it should flow naturally through the things that I'm I'm uniquely gifted to do. I think people should do engage because it's the perfect way to get a a really good understanding of God's story and where you fit in the story, and um, to take your focus off this little piece that we are in this story and to see it on such a bigger scale. Um, and to see where we fit into that and being engaged in that, in, in life and in the mission all together, no matter what your piece is, is really important. Engage is really for everyone, not just the lay person. It's for the common uh, Christian. Uh, everyone should be interested in deepening their walk with the Lord. Um, again, Paul exhorts Timothy, if you're going to disperse the Word of God in any context, you really should have a knowledge of Scripture. So Engage allows you to do that. It broadens your, uh, your, your uh, scriptural knowledge, uh, your deep things of God. It just allows you to, to get exposed to some things that perhaps you ordinarily wouldn't get exposed to. And when you have that opportunity to speak to someone, those things you're familiar with, and you can speak to them. You're prepared, you're equipped, you're ready to give an account. And so... It's, it's worth the time. It's worth it's worth the resources. Uh, the 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 end is soon, but it's worth to further the kingdom of God. If you want to be established in your faith, if you want to be grounded and knowledgeable at all, the first basic step. I mean, we have a really practical institution here, ready and available for us. So that's the first step I see myself taking. That's why I'm doing it. All of us see the world through our own particular lens or filter. Uh, this filter is called our worldview. Uh, in the worldview class, we're going to study how this filter radically affects how we communicate, how we see uh, the world, and um, how we understand biblical truth around us that's been shaped by our surroundings, by our environment, by uh, our relationships. We'll study uh, comparative worldviews, and we'll study how to contextualize biblical truth to better reach across uh, cultures, across boundaries of generations and uh, ethnicity. So whether you're at home uh, trying to reach a generation or a, a neighbor, uh, or whether you're internationally trying to reach another culture, this class will help you to better communicate bi biblical truth. So uh, come out. Check it out. I think you'll enjoy it. You'll learn a lot about how you communicate and others communicate towards you. This semester in Engage, I'll be teaching two classes, How to Study the Bible and Genesis Part 1. If you would like to learn how to study your Bible, this would be a great class for you. We're not going to teach you a lot about the Bible, but we're going to teach you and equip you to be able to study the Bible for yourself on your own. And in Genesis, we're going to look at the first 11 chapters of Genesis. So the major theme plots of the Bible, the fall of man, sin, the promise of a redeemer, the humanity, the doctrine of God, and, and, and a lot of big topics. I think it'll be a great class to help you understand not only Genesis, but the themes that continue throughout the rest of your Bible. Paul told the church at Rome that he was not ashamed of the gospel of God. And if I were to ask you, what is the gospel, I think a lot of you would have something that comes to mind. But I find with a, a lot of Christians, if they were to define the gospel, it would be something like this. I prayed a prayer so I go to heaven, or I believed a certain thing so I get eternal life. 
Paul wrote the letter to the church at Rome, and really the theme of it is called the Gospel of God. More commentaries have been written on the book of Romans than any other book. It is considered Paul's theological masterpiece. A lot of questions are associated with the gospel that people ask a lot of the time. Why did God save us? Uh, did God determine who would go to heaven and who would go to hell? What about people who have never heard the gospel? And they have these questions, and what they want is a quick soundbite answer. Give me a quick answer to a very complicated question, but you can't do that. Paul wrote the entire letter to the church at Rome, 16 chapters in our Bible, to explain why he's not ashamed of this gospel. If you want to learn the essentials of Christianity, if you want to understand the, the majesty of the gospel, if you want to understand the answers to the deep theological questions of your Christian faith, I encourage you to take some time, sign up for a class, and take the book of Romans. We'll go through the book verse by verse, explaining the wonderful mystery of the gospel of God. All right, I already introduced myself, so now that we're friends, I want you to go directly to the Gospel of Luke. All right, let's get to work, and um, we're going to look at the same passage of Scripture that we looked at last week, but from a different perspective. Uh, Luke finishes chapter 8 with a trilogy of stories, and all of them are keyed off of the parable of the sower, that we saw earlier in the chapter that describes how different people react differently to the Word of God based upon how well they hear or not. And this last story is really a mixture of two stories. One is the story of a mature woman who for, <coughs> excuse me, 12 years has had a hemorrhage, an issue of blood, as Dr. Luke calls it, a very technical medical term in the first century until Jesus heals her. And the second story is about a dying 12-year-old girl, and Jesus is going to bring her back from the dead. Now, last week, I talked about what to do when I feel dirty. And you might remember that in the service last week, I shared <coughs> that I have the bubonic plague from my vacation in Europe. <laughs> so I can identify with this sweet lady. Excuse me while I suck on some water. No, seriously, I, I shared something that happened to me when I was just a, a young child and a very personal thing and evidently hit a chord <coughs> with some of you because many of you contacted me this week. Some of you contacted me immediately uh, following the services last week and shared with me how you could really relate to what I was saying. And, and I mention that because if you're wrestling with some of the things that we talked about last week <coughs> and sometimes we feel dirty even though we have done nothing ourselves to feel dirty, all right, through no fault of our own. <coughs> Man, I hope that gets better real quick. So if this is something that is eating at you, I just want you to be aware that we have a pastoral care ministry. You can call Jen Madsen, who is the receptionist assistant for that area of ministry, and uh, get in and talk to somebody about that, and, and we would love to help you. And let me, let me tell you something, okay? We tend to obsess about our own health, okay, just like me and my cough, me and my post-nasal drip, post-cold, and uh, we, we, we tend to be very concerned about our health issues, our emotional health issues, our spiritual health issues, and all of that. I wonder how many of us obsess about the spiritual health of other people, seriously, as followers of Jesus. And so this morning, as we study the story of this girl who is dying, what I want to talk to you about today is simply this. I want to talk to you about when people you love are dying. And as I shared my heart with you last week <coughs> about something that happened in my life a long time ago, I want to just share my heart this morning about something that is very important that goes on right now. And let me tell you what it is. There are approximately 2,000 people groups, language groups in the world that in 2013, with all of our technology, do not have a single verse of Scripture in their language. 1,997. 
and there may be more. Sometimes we discover new groups of people. Does that mean anything to you? You know, I love this church, and, and I think what differentiates this church from many others, and, and I don't want to appear to be boasting or, or anything like that because there are a lot of good churches in this city, a lot of good churches in this country. But what is a little different, unfortunately, about Graceway is that we obsess about groups of people who have never heard who Jesus is. Who do not have scripture in their own language we take that very seriously as I said earlier what that means is we have intentionally elected to take the good news of Jesus Christ to areas of the world where a lot of times not many other people are and many times those places are difficult and dangerous and traditional methods don't work We obsess about that. We obsess about the spiritual health of people we've never met. Now that sounds a little weird until you get to know Jesus a little bit better. And you realize that Jesus was obsessed about the spiritual health of people. Now I wanna show you how this story illustrates that. There's a story about a girl who's dying and her father is desperate. We have a saying in English that desperate times call for desperate measures. And so this very desperate father has a very accurate assessment (coughs) of what is going on. Look at Luke chapter 8, verse 40. I want to read to you this passage of Scripture. And it came to pass that when Jesus was returned, (coughs) the people gladly received him, for they were all waiting for him. And behold, there came a man named Jairus, and he was a ruler of the synagogue. And he fell down at Jesus' feet and begged him that he would come into his house. For he had one only daughter, about 12 years of age, and she lay dying. But as he went, the people thronged him. This man, Jairus, is desperate. His only daughter is dying, and he knows it. Wow. Can you relate to that? There's this daddy-daughter bond, isn't there? I say that because I'm the father of two daughters. And it doesn't make any difference how old they get. That daddy-daughter thing is still there. Can you remember a few years ago, a young girl in our church by the name of Bobby Joe who suffered a incredible boating accident when she was caught in the propeller of a boat on a lake. Remember that? How her uncle and her father and others did everything that they could <coughs> to jump in and save her, and they did. Just miraculous. And by the way, Bobby Joe's doing great. I mean, that's, that's past history now, but do you, rem- I don't know about you, but I remember when I first heard that news, I was devastated. And I didn't really know Bobby Joe. I knew she was in our church, but I was absolutely devastated thinking about the parents and the grandparents and everybody involved and and what they must feel and and all of those desperate days that followed that accident wow now I mention that because I want you to go with me emotionally to what this man must feel like he knows that his only daughter is dying (coughs) and he knows that Jesus is absolutely the only hope that he has. Now, the last big miracle we saw Jesus do, he had gone with his disciples to the country of the Gadarenes. Do you remember that? Gentile territory. (coughs) And there in the Gentile territory, Jesus encountered this demonized man and cast the demons out. It was amazing. Everything about that story was unclean. you remember that? Now, here is exactly the opposite situation. Here is a man who is the ruler of a synagogue, as Luke tells us. Now, what that would mean in today's world is that he would be like a local church pastor. He would be somebody like me. And so when I understand that, I'm like, wow, really? And and I can imagine what (coughs) I would feel like if my only daughter was dying. Wow. Now, at this point, Jewish religious leaders have not taken well to Jesus, right? 
In fact, we've seen them attacking him. Their religious tradition <coughs> and worldview were blinding them to see Jesus as the fulfillment of the scriptures that they knew and loved so well. These were not evil people. These were religious people. They knew and loved the same scriptures that you and I know and love. You know, Jay was talking about his worldview class that he's going to offer. What was happening is their worldview was getting in the way of them understanding scripture. Their worldview was getting in the way of them understanding who God was. And so they were missing everything that God wanted to do. You say, well, Jeff, was this guy maybe one of Jesus' critics? I don't know. He could have been. But what I can tell you is this. He was absolutely desperate. And I don't care if he had been a critic of Jesus before. Let me tell you something. When you're desperate enough, you'll try and do anything. Can you imagine if your only daughter was dying? Even if he had been a critic of Jesus, man, he would be all on Jesus' side now. Now, speaking of desperate, let me bring this home to us. Are you really desperate to see people come to Christ? People that you love? Are you? Do you really understand what that means? Some of you know what it's like to watch a loved one die, don't you? It's horrible. You know the feelings that you have as you watch someone, the life just ebb out of them? Why is it that we obsess about that, and, and we should? But why is it that that upsets us so much, but yet the same people that we love can die and go to hell, and it seems like it doesn't mean a thing to us. You know, every person that Jesus healed died physically. And so we, we get all emotional about physical needs, and, and well, we should. But should we not be just as obsessed about the people that we love in front of us that are dying and can live a healthy life. They can have mental and emotional and physical health and die and go to hell. I mean, that's what the Bible says. Why don't we obsess about that? And so this guy comes, he falls down at Jesus' feet <coughs> in a position of sincere submission that we've not seen thus far from a religious leader. Are we really that desperate to be totally in submission to Jesus Christ, the only one who can make the people that we love whole? As Jairus struggles to make his way through the crowd to Jesus, he's thinking, man, if I can just get to Jesus, but I can only get to Jesus. He's the only hope that I have for my daughter. Now stay with me. Imagine what he's feeling. And just about the time he gets to Jesus and he's explaining the case to Jesus, <coughs> all of a sudden this woman with the issue of blood comes up and touches the hem of Jesus' robe. And all of a sudden Jesus stops. And all of a sudden time stops. And Jesus turns and says, who touched me? And, and then we see the story that we looked at last week when Jesus all of a sudden turns his whole focus and attention to this woman and healing her. And Jairus is like, hey, hey, what about my daughter? Hey, remember me? We, we were on the way to my house, remember? My daughter's dying. Wow. You know, as Jairus struggled to make his way through the adoring crowds, it says in verse, uh, the last verse here, it says that the people thronged him. You know another way you could translate that? They choked him, which reminds us of earlier in the chapter, chapter 8, verse 14, in the parable of the sower where Jesus talked about the seed of the word of God that fell upon a certain soil and it flourished for a while, but then the cares and riches of this world choked it out. You know, I'm just wondering if maybe the reason 
that you and I sometimes don't see the people that we love who are dying come to Jesus Christ is because we have allowed the cares and the riches and the attractions of this life to choke out the Word of God in us. We're a church that has, I think, sincerely grown our ministry of personal growth. And I'm grateful for that. But listen to me. We have an end as followers of Jesus Christ. And our end is not for us to be healthy. Our end is to make disciples of all of the people groups on this planet. We need to be healthy so that we can accomplish the mission. But when we are in good health, God makes us whole, he makes us well, he makes us healthy so that our broken hearts are mended in order to take the gospel to a dying world. And can I be honest, I don't see that a lot. I see people say, hey, thanks Jesus, I feel better now. Now I get on with my life. I'll get back with you whenever I need you again. I'm sorry, I don't see that in the Bible. This man has both passion and patience. Here's Jairus. He, he's fighting to get through the crowd. Everything stops as this older woman comes up with this issue of blood and touches Jesus. Time stops. What would you feel? Anger? Frustration? Panic? All of the above? What will he do? Will he give up? Will he give up on Jesus? Will he lose his faith? Well, as we look at the story that we just read, there appears to be no road rage type reaction. Jairus does not lose his passion, but he appears to have an abundance of patience, doesn't he? Trusting that his time will come and trusting that he will have his moment with Jesus. This is critical. Can you, can you imagine, have you ever known somebody that's been on, like on a kidney transplant list or a heart transplant list? You know what I'm talking about? And it's, it's, isn't it crazy? I, I've, never, I've never experienced that personally. I've never had anybody in my immediate family, and obviously I've never been in that position, but I, I, I've been around people who have, and it's like, well, yeah, I'm number, I'm number three. And it's like, so who makes up these lists, and how does that work, and how do you determine that, and how could one person be more important? You, you know what I'm saying? And, and so th this guy has come to Jesus. Jesus, my daughter's dying. You know, when I look at this, it reminds me to never give up for dead the people that I love. And I look back at my life, and I think sometimes I have given up on people. And I think I've just said, well, that, per that person's just never going to understand. That person's just never going to. You know what? Sometimes I've been wrong. But even in that process, many times things go from bad to worse. Now, here, here's poor Jairus. He, he's been interrupted by this woman with the issue of blood. And so he's standing there watching with his mouth open, I'm sure, as Jesus says, who touched me? And, 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 and turns and heals this woman. And this issue of blood that she's had for 12 years is miraculously stopped. Wow. And everybody's going, whoa, look what Jesus did. Now, right at that moment, I want you to look at verse 48. And he said unto her, Daughter, be of good comfort. Your faith has made you whole. Go in peace. While he yet spoke, there comes one from the ruler of the synagogue's house saying to him, Your daughter is dead. Trouble not the master. 
while he yet spoke. This connects these two stories. His daughter has died. It's over. Don't waste Jesus' time. Wow. Again, can you, can you relate to that emotionally, how he must feel? Suspended in time, paralyzed, numb, confused, having no idea what to say or do. What, I mean, what do you do? You've just talked Jesus into coming to your house, but now what good is that? Your daughter's dead. Does it sometimes appear to you that Jesus is too late? You ever, you ever had that feeling? I have a couple of times in my life. Oh, God, if you would have just, when I first prayed, if you would have just, if you would have just, if you would have just. Can you remember Martha and, and Mary, the sisters of Lazarus, when Lazarus would have died and been in the tomb for four days, and when Jesus finally got there, both of them came out and said, Jesus, if you would have just been here, if you would have just been here. You know, sometimes it does seem like Jesus is too late, doesn't it? Now, let me ask you a question. So what, what happens if Jairus gives up right now? I can tell you what will happen. We wouldn't be reading this story in the Bible, would we? Do we give up on people too easily, classify them as being unreachable, beyond hope? I think the question is, how desperate are you? And how much do you believe God? But here's the good news. Jesus has a time for everyone and everything. And just as this messenger is making this announcement, your daughter's dead, don't trouble the master. Jesus overhears. And this time it's not the woman, it's Jesus who interrupts. And he springs into action. And he says in verse 50, but when Jesus heard it, he answered him saying, fear not, believe only, and she shall be made whole. Now, who initiated that? Was it Jairus? No, he was still patiently waiting. I'm sure he's confused, frustrated, angry, panicked, all of those things, but he's patiently waiting. But I want you to notice something. Jesus answered him, not because Jairus prayed harder, not because he cried louder, not because he tried harder. Jesus answered him. Jesus interrupted him. He said, fear not. Fear is the enemy of faith, and it doesn't come from God. Listen to what 1 John chapter 4, 18 says, there is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear, because fear has torment. He that fears is not made perfect in love. Can I just say something lovingly? If you're a fearful person and you're worried about stuff all the time, can I just tell you that's why you need to learn the Bible? because you've not yet been made perfect in God's love. Because love cast out fear. Fear not. And then what did Jesus say? He said, believe only. It corresponds to what he had said to the woman back in verse 48 when he said, your faith has made you whole. Go in peace. Now, don't confuse things. I know what some of you are thinking. Think, oh, so we don't have to do anything. No, whoa, whoa, whoa. You remember the whole emphasis since we've been talking about this parable of the sower in, in Luke chapter 8 and, and how we've talked about when you hear in the Bible, the very word itself implies hearing so as to do. So it's not inactivity. It's, it's not saying, oh, all i got to do is believe, and then I, I don't do it. No, because we believe and put our faith in Jesus, because we hear the Word of God, that's what motivates us to serve Him and to obey Him. That's what happens. Did you hear the young guy this morning just got baptized and talking about being at camp, and all of a sudden he's, he's experiencing what he's never experienced before, and, and this love for God in him is just springing up, and he says, okay, I'm ready to take the first step in obedience. So why is he getting baptized? So he can get something from God? So that he can get saved? So that he can get his sins? No, no, because all of a sudden he has met God in a personal way, and because he's heard the Word of God, he's going to do the Word of God. 
So don't confuse those things. Don't think that I'm preaching inactivity. We've been talking about that a lot lately. And the point is that healing results from God's grace, not human effort. God's healing is out of our control. Talking about obsessing about different things. Have you ever noticed how we, we tend to obsess about things we can't control? Like the weather. Anybody here learned how to control the weather? I can get you a great job on any one of the channels here in Kansas City as a weather person, all right? We can't control the weather. We obsess about it. We can't control it. We obsess about our health, but you know, many things about our health we sometimes can't control. Some things we can, a lot of things we can, but some things we can't. Why is it we don't obsess about the one thing that we can control? Prayer. We control that, don't we? But we don't want to obsess about that. The one thing that we can control. Wow. So this, this guy's got a choice, to believe or to give up. And Jesus announces that the girl is not dead. And those who had gathered to grieve, <coughs> they laugh him to scorn. They know that she is dead. They're sure that she is dead. So before doing his work of healing, Jesus asks all to leave and takes with him only his inner circle of three, James, John, and Peter, and his mother and father, first mention of her mother, who must have been by her side during this entire time. And by the way, folks, this principle applies in any area of life. It all comes down to hearing and doing the Word of God. That's what the parable of the soul is about, right? hearing and doing the Word of God. Fear not, believe only. Let's go. Are you motivated by fear or by faith? You're the only person who can answer that. Is God merely a good luck token to you? Is God merely somebody you fill out of your pocket when you get in a pinch and you try to talk him into doing something good to rescue you? You know, if that's your God, your God is pathetically small and pathetically powerless. If God is really who the Bible says that he is, then we should fall down at his feet in submission, just like this Jairus. In verse 54, it says, he put them all out and took her by the hand and called, saying, young woman, arise. You know what she did? But here's the cool thing. Hearing begins another level of responsibility. Holistic healing includes nourishment and growth. Verse 55 says, and her spirit came again, and she arose right away, and he commanded to give her food. Now, this is the sim symbolism of Jesus' command here to give her food. She has been raised from the dead, but miraculous healing does not exempt her from the laws of the natural world. Do you understand what I'm saying? She has been raised from the dead, but she's still going to have to eat and sleep and exercise. Are you with me? Just the fact that she's been raised from the dead doesn't exempt her from natural law. What if, what if this young woman would have simply refused to eat, insisting, oh, I've been raised from the dead. You don't understand. Jesus is raised from the dead. I don't need to eat anymore. I don't need to sleep anymore. I'm good. Some of you giggled. So why do you, some of you do that when you come to life spiritually? Why do you think you don't need nourishment? Why do you think you don't need to engage in God's mission? I mean, really, what's up with that? All of those things are important. And this is the purpose of the local assembly, that the church, the small group directions, and, and the natural growth path that we have as believers. The end is the mission, not the healing. And that's why verse 56 says, her parents were astonished, but he charged them that they should tell no one what was done. Now, there's a statement that often confuses us, right? Seems kind of odd that he didn't want them to tell anybody. 
In fact, it's repeated often in the Gospels until after the resurrection. And the point is simply this. Jesus doesn't want to be known as the healer. Jesus doesn't want to be known as the king. He wants to be known right now as the savior. I wonder what emphasis sometimes we give him in the church today. When the people around us that we love are dying, and we don't even talk about him as Savior. Savior. Wow. You know, we can all relate to the emotions of a father whose 12-year-old daughter is dying, the fact that he loves her. Over the last couple of weeks, we've talked a lot about love. We're right in the middle of small group sign-up for our next small group cycle. You remember what I told you last week? Small group is where we learn to do what well? We learn to love well. If we love God, does it not stand to reason that we will love what God has created in his image? What did God create in his image, people? Well, I love God, I just hate people. No, you're messed up. If you love God, you love what is created in his image, and that is other people. And that's why we need to learn to love well. Small group is where you learn to love well. Why do we need to learn to love well? Because there is a dying world that needs to hear the gospel. Not just the people that we love, but people we've not even met who need to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. Coming up next month in September, all five Sundays, we're going to set aside for those five Sundays the study of Luke. We're going to have a series called the Injustice Series. We're going to trust God to raise $200,000, not to build something physical, but to translate the Word of God into the language of a people who do not know who Jesus is. People that we've never met, people that you probably never will. And the point is simply this, there is so much more going on in this world than your physical, emotional, and spiritual health. We need to be healthy because there is a world with which we need to engage with the mission of God. Healthy churches give generously because they care about dying people, not because they're comfortable. Are we desperate enough? Not only about the people that we love, but the people that we don't even know for which God has left us on this planet to be representatives of his love? Or have we become a Christianity so narcissistic, so self-centered, so ego-driven that it really is all about us? Would you begin to pray with me about September? Would you begin to pray that God would engage us in his mission? in a way like we've never seen before.